Good afternoon, everyone. After lunch, it's always going to be an interesting session, but at least we're not talking about security. So <laughs> <laughs> My name is Faz. Uh, I'm one of the EMEA Specialist Solution Architects at Red Hat, and I focus on Kubernetes cluster management and automation. I'm Luca Ferrari. I'm Italian, and I'm a Edge Computing Specialist, so you might have heard Red Hat recently is investing in Edge quite a bit. Uh, and I have a background in uh, integration and API management. So a few years ago, um, I had a call from my father's neighbor. They called to tell me that they heard my dad's little dog barking in the garden. And when they went to find out what the problem was, they found my father lying down on the patio, unable to get up. So he had a fall and he couldn't manage to get himself back up. Um, fortunately, that day, they called the ambulance. And by the time I made it there, my dad got the medical attention he needed. But this wasn't the only time this was happening. My dad suffered from Parkinson's and Parkinson's related dementia. So if he didn't have someone with him all the time to remind him of his limitations, he would set up on walks. And sadly, sometimes on that cold day, the floor would be slippery, he would have a fall, and he couldn't get himself back up. Sadly, as probably a lot of you are aware, this, his story is not unique. In fact, according to the National Safety Council in the US, a big chunk of falls that happen at home and cause preventable injuries, and sadly, injury-related deaths are related to falls. And these falls are very common amongst the elderly. And you know, we're facing a, an aging population. So this problem is only gonna get worse and worse. So if the elderly don't get the care they need at home, they're very likely to have a fall. Um, they might neglect themselves and they end up in A&E in the hospital. And that means pressure on the health and social care. Um, so we're just looking into see how we can use technology um, to help with this problem. The reason that we, we are looking into this assistive care today is because the hospitals are already overwhelmed with a lot of day-to-day -day problems. Um, they have a lot of legacy systems and devices that they need to integrate and maintain. They uh, produce a large amount of unstructured data by the medical equipment that needs to be maintained and they need to, they need to be compliant with industry standards. Patients are expecting to be um, to be able to look at the data online. And on top of this, the hospitals don't have a big IT, IT budget or IT team to be able to resolve this problem. And that's why we're trying to see how we can use open source to relieve this burden of at least with the elderly and the assisted living from the hospitals. Yeah, so uh, given the challenges we've seen, um, there are several advantages of using an edge computing approach when it comes to assisted care and using open source at all layers. So first of all, in terms of Red Hat project and products, um, you can see that we started adopting at the edge uh, the same platform that we adopt at the core, which is basically Kubernetes. So that brings uh, manageability advantages. So the, the team doesn't have to learn a new, a new tool, basically, or a new technology. Uh, then there is security by default at all levels. So through tools like ACS, Advanced Cluster Security, you can implement policy that automatically secure new clusters or in the case of assisted care, uh, secure new homes. Um, then there is a whole partner ecosystem. So I, I mean, I don't have to explain it to you, but uh, the power of community here is pretty strong. Uh, so we can, for example, connect to legacy protocols through library developed by community. And we have a whole set of partner products that can be deployed at the edge or at the core indifferently. Um, and then eventually manageability and uh, scale. So uh, when you think about uh, an edge architecture, what comes to mind is actually uh, day two or thinking about deploying the second, third, or eventually a hundred cluster after the first one. So deploying the first one and managing the first one is quite easy, but what about managing at scale? So then you have tools like Advanced Cluster Manager that help you with that scenario. 
So we came up with actually a reference architecture uh, in this case and with the specific use case of uh, assisted, assisted care. And uh, we look into literature on uh, what are the type of sensors and scenario that can help detect a possible uh, death at home, let's just say. So there is a full mix of technology, as you can see here, uh, quite a recipe. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're familiar if you're uh, been working a little bit with home automation with Raspberry and Arduino, so I will not explain a little a lot about those. Uh, we use two different messaging technologies, so uh, you might have heard of NQ Broker as in Artemis as a project, so that's a store and forward broker. We used it for NQTT messages, but it's a multi-protocol uh, broker. Then we use NQ Streams, so that's actually Red Hat packaging of Kafka. So you might know the project as Streamzy. Um, and we use it for event streaming scenarios, right? So when you want to process data at the core. Um, I don't think I need to explain anything about OpenShift. Um, there, uh, Faz will be able to answer any question on ACM <laughs> after the session. <laughs> And uh, we use Camel with Quarkus, so uh, there are also quite a number of talks today uh, about Quarkus. Uh, there are now extensions to actually run Camel integration on top of Quarkus runtime, so to make <coughs> the integration even lighter. This is for all the scenario where you want to integrate legacy or industrial protocols, for example, at the edge. Um, then we use for the monitoring and uh, presentation part Grafana and Timescale. Timescale is actually a time series database that's included as part of uh, Draw that you see here. And Grafana, well, allows you to build custom dashboards. So in case the hospital wants to have uh, current state monitoring of what's the patient scenario, they can do that. Um, then we use Ansible for all the event-driven automation uh, case that uh, Faz is gonna explain in a bit. And I'll deep dive a little bit more into Edge Impulse uh, and Drop. So Edge Impulse is, um, well, it's a, I just call it a studio, an online studio for MLOps. Uh, so if you're familiar with OpenShift data science, it's not that dissimilar. The difference is that it's highly focused on uh, machine learning at the edge on very low resource devices. Uh, so that's especially important because a lot of this sensor and this platform uh, are not really single node OpenShift or are not really beefy, right? So if you want to run some machine learning model on stuff like Raspberry, that's a really good, uh, good tool. Um, the other interesting element that you can see here is that you can start building your model directly on your smartphone and then deploy it as a test case on your smartphone, either Android or Apple. Uh, this is Drog. Instead, this is a Red Hat project. Uh, you might want to take a look at it if you're interested in into, um, processing data and coming from IoT, uh, IoT environment. And there is a whole set of layers. So in this case, this was the, the diagram was more focused on automotive use case. So you can see the little car there. But basically, uh, there are two main concepts, the devices and the application. So the devices are at the left-hand side. Um, they are basically all your sensors and actuators. Um, and then you have the application. So the application are mm, what the end user might use or develop. Um, and typically, several devices are associated to one or more application. Um, so you have an ingestion point through the endpoints to the left. Uh, so Drog supports HTTP, Hope, and NQTT. Uh, then eventually, there's a data streaming component through NQ streams. So you see there Kafka. Uh, there is a whole set of uh, authentication, both related to devices and applications with Keyclock. Uh, and you also have a set of device management and device registering functionalities, okay? Uh, eventually, the data that can be processed 
uh, filtered um, and even there's a basic rule engine is exposed through integration uh, through the right hand side where you can see WebSockets, MQTT, Kafka and even um, serverless events. So this is the architecture we came up with. Um, as I was uh, explaining before, we used NQBoker to ingest the events coming through NQTT uh, communication from the sensors. Um, then, let me just maybe switch to the actual data flow. So then the, this is, oh yeah, it is <laughs> animating. So then the, the messages are eventually stored uh, in the event streaming uh, part of Drobe. Uh, Drobe will apply some filtering, so for example, uh, will not actually activate any alert uh, in specific scenarios. Um, it will also store for historic purpose all the events in the timescale DB for later exploration. Um, and then it will send, uh, and then Ansible uh, will actually get triggered uh, on specific uh, situation through events on a specific topic on NQ streams. Uh, eventually, Ansible will trigger a call or in our case, a message to Telegram. So the idea here is that um, given specific scenarios that uh, we'll explain soon, um, a nurse will be alerted that there is a patient to be visited. <laughs> she will travel to the assisted uh, house. Right, so the use cases we've tried to impl implement um, using the technology we just saw are one of them is the fall detection alarm as a wearable uh, and the other one is a fridge usage monitor so essentially just to monitor the state of whether the fridge door is open and closed and then decide later on based on that information what we need to do and also the scenario of combining these two through sensor fusion who knows about sensor fusion? Who has worked with the concept of sensor fusion before? Okay, so sensor fusion is just uh, the process of combining the data that we get from different sensors or different disparate sources of information in order to get a better understanding or a clear um, picture of the whole situation on a high level, that's the explanation. So it's just combining the, the, uh, the data that we get from our sensors. So for the fridge usage monitor, so we divided the use cases into two parts. I worked on the fridge usage monitor and Luca worked on the fall detection alarm. For the fridge usage monitor, what I used was an Arduino Uno Wi-Fi and um, the read switch connected to it. Uh, the read switch is just an electromagnetic switch that based on the voltage, high or low, you can decide whether the door is close. Based on the magnet being close to each other, you get a high or low voltage and then you can detect whether the door is open or closed. So I started um, implementing the code on Arduino Wi-Fi, um, which is this little board here, which worked really well to begin with and gave me a full sense of security. But as I went along and I was trying to implement SSL, it took me a long time to get to do that. And then I realized the libraries that I was using on this Arduino Wi-Fi not, do not support SSL properly. So then I switched over to this um, ESB Remask board and I managed to get SSL working on that, which was a, a good success. Um, and just to, to show you a little bit of the code snippet from the, the Arduino, as you can see, we're just reading the serial, the data that comes through the serial board, and uh, we're just sending the information through the, using the MQTT client of the, that's available on Arduino libraries, we're sending the information to our MQTT broker. In case anyone hasn't come across MQTT broker, it's just a lightweight network protocol for pops up. Yeah, the other case? use case uh, was based on an interesting scenario and device. So the device you see on the left hand side is uh, this small thing. Uh, so interestingly enough, this can run a very basic uh, TensorFlow light model and you can deploy it using Edge Impulse as I was saying before. Um, and then I basically aggregate all the measurements uh, through Bluetooth on a Raspberry Pi. So this then communicates back to the NQ broker uh, in Snow. Um, so 
I'm not going to show you any C++ code because I'm not really proficient in C++, but <laughs> basically Edge Impulse generates uh, after you, uh, I'm going to explain it afterwards, but the way it works, you uh, generate and train the model and then you can export it in several ways. One of them is just uh, an agnostic uh, model, which is just in C++, means you can deploy it almost anywhere. Uh, and as you can see, there's the structure, the model parameters, uh, the SDK, which means, uh, which is the runtime, and then the actual TensorFlow Lite model. So the way it works, as I was saying before, if you've been uh, experimenting with uh, OpenShift Data Science or uh, Open Data Hub, I think it's the upstream, um, it's just a standard MLOps platform, so you get to design the model using several libraries. You get to train it and collect new data sets. Um, you get to test the accuracy of the model and eventually deploy it on several edge targets. Uh, so this is an example of the interface. As you can see here in our case, we were interested in uh, measuring the acceleration in X, Y, Z axis. So that's one thing the Nano can do. Uh, there are other sensor package on the Nano. Uh, and based on this variation, the model basically identifies whether this is uh, somebody falling or, or not. Uh, eventually, you get to be able to deploy on several uh, tiny platforms. So as you can see, uh, there are several Arduino platforms supported, uh, but there are other certified platforms for Edge Impulse. So there is an alternative uh, to this tool, uh, which is not online, it's completely on-premise, which is TinyML. So if you want to explore that, instead of using the cloud approach, it's also worth it. Um, so the, ah, yeah, this was basically to recap a little bit. So we were up to the sensor layer. And eventually, we decided to introduce NQ Broker to actually store the messages for persistence. So somebody <coughs> might ask why the sensor are not directly communicating with uh, the cloud. The OpenShift platform is for persistence and uh, resiliency reasons. So we configure NQ Broker so that it, it exposed uh, among the several protocols it support and QTT. And as you can see, we created uh, a queue and an address related to this type of traffic, so the Arduino one. And you can see an example of uh, messages. So you can browse the queue and see the content of uh, the message. And then I configure also Droke. So I created an application corresponding to the end user application. So in this case, it was just a notifier application. And this notifier application had associated several sensors. So as you can see, I can also create an IoT ga gateway in uh, Droke. And uh, you can create a hierarchy between the actual IoT gateway and the other sensors. OK, so, so far we've seen how we're just getting the data from our sensor. They come to AMQ Broker, redirect it to Droke. And as a part of Droke, as you can see, there's an um, AMQ streams um, section that comes with draw. So now the notification part involves the data from AMQ streams or, or Kafka and Ansible and EDA or event driven um, automation. So what you see here is an example of the event driven um, automation using Ansible. This is the, the main component is called the rule book. Um, within the rule book we've got two sections which we've got the sources section which we have different plugin sources for it in this case we're using kafka and then we've got the rule section which based on a condition and action is triggered and as you can see it's quite simple the, the usual um, ansible style um, so we're just saying that if you're getting that condition that the door closing is, is detected from kafka trigger a playbook um, and the playbook we've got <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's just the, uh, the automation controller. As you can see, that playbook is just running in there. So just call the automation controller, like that playbook. And the playbook is pretty simple. We're just using the collection, Telegram collection, to send that notification. And eventually, when that is done, uh, we will get the, the notification message, or the carer, or the family member, or the nurse will get the notification on their phone, whether a fall is detected, or what's happening with the fridge door, 
and, uh, and so forth. So this is what we've done so far with these two use cases. Still work in progress, we're still working on improving them and we're hoping to start introducing more use cases um, to this, this POC. So you may have noticed we haven't talked about Camel Caucus part of the, the architecture because we haven't implemented it yet, but we will. We're looking into implementing some sort of local level one alerting using Camel. And we haven't talked about Rackham because we've been focusing on the application side of this POC and what actually we can do with it. Rackham takes care of the infrastructure side uh, we have used uh, ACM in order to provision our single node authorship cluster and also um, implement the, the configuration and application on it. And that's just, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this if you work with that thing, that's just the, uh, the cluster size which you see in there. So to conclude on some lesson learned, so you might have already been fighting with certificates so PLS certificate and DNS are usually the culprits of uh, issues when it comes to development and integration. Um, also, the test case I was showing with the Nano, it's all through a USB cable. Even if you have a really long one, you might uh, actually think about adding batteries so that somebody can work on the wrist. Um, also, it was quite hard uh, personally to develop this uh, joint project since we're not in the same country so we and we are also not really developers so uh, we had a tough time using remote calls for pair program I just say um, also we were showing the single node open shift on AWS my initial idea was to bring an industrial grade uh, server to the stage but it's really hard to actually connect to both power and, and network in general. Um, we also were trying to have fast connecting to my home lab for some tests, but VPN access to internet is not as easy as it looks like. Uh, and eventually, I don't know if you guys have been experimenting with uh, false security uh, with the recent version of OpenShift, but it can be quite tough to run something. Um, so just to uh, remind you what you can explore in terms of uh, initiatives inside Red Hat. So there's a healthcare validated pattern. So I don't know if you heard about validated pattern. This is dedicated to basically analyzing uh, medical images and providing a better diagnosis to doctors. Um, this is all done through uh, OpenShift Data Science that I mentioned before. And basically what validated pattern is, is really just a way to, just a POC code that you can re-execute. Uh, it's stored in GitHub so you can contribute and it's uh, designed by industry and by use case. So yeah, just as a, as a recap of the whole thing, we're just putting this effort into uh, using open source for assisted, um, assisted care. So hopefully when it gets our time to retire, we will have a happy and healthy retirement. Any question on anything? Yeah, sure. Yes, the, the idea is to run it there. Uh, as you probably, there, are, there were a couple sessions, uh, you can even run MicroShift if you have limited hardware resources. Uh, it's given the workload we are working with, it will run on MicroShift. So actually, there is. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if I understood correctly, the question is where, where do you get the data for the model to be precise, right? The following model to be... So actually there is quite a data set already available. I didn't have to train it myself, but with Edge Impulse you can even train it yourself and add your own data to the model quite easily. We just wanted to um, to just incorporate as many Red Hat products as we could, given the title of the talk is just using Red Hat technology. So that was one of the main reasons behind using EBA. Yeah, but <laughs> I guess also the advantage is that with you can automate uh, other stuff, so you can leverage it for future future use cases as well. Yeah, so the, actually the output is cloud events, which is a standard, so you can trigger even stuff on AWS, I guess, or other platforms.